Mouth breathing in children. The physiological normal mode of the human being is breathing through the nose regardless of age. But any factor which causes the nose to be stuffy is going to replace nasal breathing with mouth breathing. The key to remember here is that even after the nose has been treated, mouth breathing will persist in most cases due to the patient's mouth breathing habit. And mouth breathing is characterized by a set of symptoms and signs present in subjects who replace adequate and efficient nasal breathing for a period equal or more than six months. To identify the prevalence of mouth breathing in children aged between six and nine years of age in Portugal, researchers found from 496 answered questionnaires that 56.8% of these children breathed through their mouth. In another paper, in a town with a population of 23,000 inhabitants, 370 children were randomly selected. Clinical assessment was carried out and 55% of the children in this study were found to be mouth breathers. Another Brazilian paper looking at 150 children with ages between 8 and 10 years of age. They did two tests. One test was to breathe steam against a mirror, in other words a fogging test. And the second test was to see could the child maintain water in the mouth for up to three minutes. They found that mouth breathing prevalence here was 53.3%. Another paper, a Japanese study with very young children aged between two and six years, questionnaire to parents, they had 468 valid responses. Mouth breather in daytime if they had two or more positive items. Breathing with the mouth ordinarily, mouth is open ordinarily, mouth is open when chewing. Mouth open when chewing is an interesting question to ask parents because many parents will be aware of it that you know they may not necessarily be aware that their child is a mouth breather but they might be a little bit more aware in that the child could be mouth breathing during chewing. So while having food at a table the child is eating dinner with the child with a stuffy nose isn't going to be able to maintain eating with their mouth closed. So they will be eating noisily and breathing at the same time. And of course, parents can get upset with this. So they're likely to notice it in their child. Mouth breathing during sleep. If they had two or more of the positive items, if they were snoring, if the mouth was open during sleep, or if the mouth is dry when the child wakes up. Now snoring doesn't necessarily indicate mouth breathing, even though the researchers used it here. You could have the child is snoring through their nose. But a good point to ask is, is the child, do they have a dry mouth when they wake up in the morning? Or ask the parents, do you smell the breath of the child? Does the, does the child have a strong smell of their breath when they wake up? The prevalence of mouth breathing during the day, according to this Japanese study, was 35.5%. And during sleep, it was 45.9%. Interestingly, there was a significant association between mouth breathing disorder and atopic dermatitis. Working with adults and children since 2002, we have noticed that some children and adults that their skin conditions actually improved quite dramatically when they switched from mouth to nasal breathing. Acne rosacea, for example. We've had a number of cases um, whereby the typical treatment for these patients was using antibiotics. But when we changed their breathing pattern disorders, their skin condition improved. This could be due to the fight or flight response associated with mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is fast breathing, hard breathing, using the upper chest and resulting in a dry mouth. A moist mouth is conducive to activation of the parasympathetic response. A dry mouth is typically associated with stress. Upper chest breathing is stress breathing. Diaphragmatic breathing is relaxation. So mouth breathing and fast breathing, nasal breathing and slow breathing. So our breathing patterns feed into stress, just as stress feeds into breathing. And if an individual has abnormal breathing or inefficient breathing, that is likely to be activating the fight or flight. And that may be contributing to different conditions which can be affected by stress. Recognizing oral breathing in children. In this paper, the researchers interviewed 110 orthodontists regarding the clinical evaluation of mouth breathing. They found that there was no standardization 
for the clinical recognition of mouth breathing amongst orthodontists. The most common procedures performed were inefficient to recognize differences between mouth breathing by habit or mouth breathing by obstruction. Now for us, there is no real difference. If a child comes in to me, if they are mouth breathing, they are mouth breathing. If they are mouth breathing by obstruction, we will look to address the obstruction. If it's rhinitis, we can improve it very, very quickly by practicing the breathing techniques. If it is adenoids, we will refer to a dentist, a functional dentist or orthodontist who can help develop the airways. If the mouth breathing is by habit, we will also work by that. So we don't necessarily differentiate between the two. Mouth breathing is mouth breathing, but regardless, is it habit or is it obstruction? But here's the guidelines that the researchers developed and they tested it in 687 children aged between 6 and 12 years of age. Firstly, the dentist performs a visual assessment of the child. With the patient standing, do they have a lack of lip seal? In other words, is their mouth open? Are there postural changes? Because mouth breathing children, we do develop forward head posture as a compensatory mechanism of having the mouth open. Dark circles under the eyes can be related to venous pooling which in turn can be related to hard mouth breathing, which causes a loss of carbon dioxide. This results in arterial blood vessels to constrict, but venous blood vessels to expand. So the venous pooling underneath the eyes, the black bags underneath the eyes that we often see with mouth breathing kids may be because of a disturbance to their blood gases. Long facial structure, of course, a child with their mouth open Gravity, the face is sinking downwards, the face grows long and narrow as opposed to being broad. With the patient sitting, check is there an anterior open bite? Is there a high narrow palate? And the problem with a high narrow palate is that the high narrow palate is going to infringe into the nasal cavity. With a reduction to the size or space of the nasal cavity, the individual may feel a suffocation when they breathe through their nose and as a result they switch to mouth breathing so it's a vicious circle. With mouth breathing, there may be an increase in gingivitis in the maxillary incisors. The questions that are directed to the child or parents, does the child sleep with an open mouth? Do they have their mouth open when they are distracted? For example, if they're watching TV, if they're doing homework, if they're on iPod or iPad, or if they're a passenger in the back seat of a car, does the child snore? Does the child drool on the pillow? Or do they experience excessive daytime sleepiness? Because remember, mouth breathing is conducive to a poor quality sleep. Not all children who mouth breathe have excessive daytime sleepiness. They could in fact have hyperactivity. Because if they are sleeping with their mouth open during sleep, and if they have sleep disorder breathing, they're in that fight or flight response. And that fight or flight response that's happening during their sleep is carrying through to during the day resulting in increased hyperactivity, poor attention, etc. Is the child waking up with a headache? This can be associated with stopping of the breath during sleep, which leads to an increase of carbon dioxide. So hypercapnia, which in turn is going to cause the blood vessels supplying the brain with oxygen, blood vessels dilate, and it could bring on a headache. Does the child get tired easily? In other words, they wake up quite all right, but they slump very easily. They don't have resilience, to maintain energy throughout the day. Do they often have allergies, especially nasal allergies? Do they have a stuffy nose, a runny nose? Do they have difficulty in school? Do they have difficulty concentrating? This is interesting because in the guidelines, in assessing whether the child is breathing through the open mouth, you are seeing the connection with sleep, you are seeing the connection with school, you are seeing the connection with concentration. The breathing test used here is the graded mirror test. So basically they have a child breathe onto a mirror and then they mark the size of the halo. So if the halo is low, if it's up to 30 millimeters, if it's an average is 30 to 60 millimeters and a high nasal flow is above 60 millimeters. The second test that they do is the water retention test. So they ask the child to place 15 milliliters of water in their mouth to see can they hold onto it for about three minutes or so. Now personally, I think this is going to be something with age. I can't imagine very young children being able to do it. You know, you give them 15 milliliters of water, they'll swallow it, they'll spit it out. But certainly the older kids may be able to master this. My preference in the, the test is the third one. 
and that's to seal the patient's mouth completely with tape for three minutes because a child with an obstructed airway will repeatedly take off the tape. Now, if it's the front of the nose rhinitis that's the problem, it's not a problem because we can help address that very easy by doing breath hold exercises and also by establishing nasal breathing. The adenoids are a slightly different matter. Here we do need a multidisciplinary approach. Functional dentistry, expand the airways, make room in the airways so that the child can establish nasal breathing. With the child establishing nasal breathing, the child is able to harness the benefits of nasal nitric oxide. And of course, the nose conditions the air, moistens and warms, filters the air, so that you've got a filtered and conditioned air meeting the adenoids. The adenoids then are more likely to shrink. The training to eliminate the habit of mouth breathing is the lip seal tape. And I think this is absolutely wonderful. I incorporated this into my practice teaching young children because sometimes it was a little bit frustrating. We'd go through all of the exercises with the child. We would be able to open up their nose and we were able to establish nasal breathing. But a week later, the child would come back in with the mouth wide open. And this would be happening not with every kid, but certainly some children, it took a lot of work in order to establish that habit. We have to consider neuroplasticity here. How can we change the neural pathways in the brain that the brain is associating nasal breathing with breathing? Generally, this will take 60 to 70 days. The game changer for me was after reading this paper. We then introduced mouth taping to the children during the day. We'd start them off after the first session for 15 minutes a day. The second session, we'd increase it between 15 and 30 minutes, especially when the child was distracted. If they're on iPhone, watching TV, iPad, doing homework, watching a movie, placing paper tape across the lips to start the habit of nasal breathing.